Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name's Carl Larson from RMCG. Um, you may have met uh, us before as deliverers of the VegNet program in Victoria in the southeast, western and northern regions. Um, today, we're going to be covering uh, vegetable levy R&D updates. And thank you for your flexibility. We've had a, a few changes just with the um, evolving COVID-19 situation at the moment and we really wanted to make sure we could still get this update and information to you um, but just choosing a different format than face-to-face -face, uh, down in Clyde um, even though it's a, a lovely sunny day out there today unfortunately um, we'll be presenting remotely but look that's not to say we don't have the same uh, great lineup of speakers for you um, so we've got seven presenters for you today so quite a bit to get to um, and we're going to have a slightly reduced format, so not the full two hours online, but uh, looking to start um, at four o'clock and have everything wrapped up by half past five in 90 minutes. So today we've got a number of projects that are going to be providing a short update of a, about 10 minutes each with the chance for you to have some questions um, with each of the speakers. And we're going to start with Ilya Pirtle from Caesar, who's going to be talking to us about the Vegetable Leaf Miner Program. Um, after that, we're going to be covering things around tomato, potato salad, IMAP pests, harvest to home, um, IPM and beneficial arthropods, the EnviroVeg Program, as well as Soil Wealth ICP. So a pretty packed agenda um, and some really fantastic projects to cover off. Just a little bit of housekeeping before we do jump into the first presentation. Um, if this is the first webinar you've joined, you'll see uh, the control panel on the side and just a refresher for those that have joined us before. Um, if you at any point want to raise a question, you'll see there's a question drop down tab in the control panel there. Any questions that you type will come straight through to me and I can put to that to one of our presenters or panelists um, to make sure that gets answered. If we are running up against time, Apologies if we don't get to it, but we'll take it offline and make sure we can address it. Um, you'll also see there's a handouts uh, pane there where we've got a couple of handouts relevant to the projects that we're going to be covering. They're available there just to click and download. Um, and we're also going to be making a recording of this session available to people as well. So uh, at any time during the discussion, please feel free to send through your questions um, and we'll put those to our presenters. As I mentioned, we're gonna start with Ilya Pertle from CESAR, um, talking us through the control, eradication and preparedness for vegetable leaf miner. So Ilya, over to you and thanks very much. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna be talking to you about a Hort Innovation funded project that's been working to build preparedness for an exotic pest called the vegetable leaf miner. And there we go. All right, so as a bit of background on this pest, um, the vegetable leaf miner is part of a group of pests called exotic polyphagous leaf miners. They are well known overseas for their really broad range of crops that they will affect. And they do all pose a threat to Australian agriculture they include a few species of sort of highest risk, and that includes Liriomyza huidabrensis and Liriomyza trifoliae, who you can see on the left. Neither of these species are present in Australia, but they both are quite close, um, as close as Indonesia. And it also includes the vegetable leaf miner, or Liriomyza sativi, we call it VLM. And this species, as of 2015, is present in Australia, though it is under quarantine within the um, far north tip of Cape York Peninsula in Seisha. All of these pests look very similar. They're small black and yellow flies, about one to two millimeters. They also all have very similar life cycles with four stages. There's an egg, a larvae, a pupa, and an adult. It's a very short life cycle. They can have many generations within a growing season. And what you can see in that GIF right there is the larval stage of the fly. And that's the most destructive stage because the larvae actually tunnels between the top and the bottom layer of a leaf. And as it tunnels, you can see them pickaxing away. Um, they create these white spirals on the leaf of the plant, and we call those leaf mines, and that's the real characteristic damage caused. If you can also see the speckles in that picture on the right, um, that stippling is caused by the adult females poking holes in the leaf to lay eggs and to feed. These three exotic leaf miner have all a very wide range of host preferences. Um, um, vegetable leaf miner in particular has over 200 host species. A lot of cultivated crops are included. 
such as celeries, cucumbers, melons, um, tomatoes, leafy veg, ornamental flowers, beans, um, and a lot of weed hosts as well. On the level of a plant, the, um, the impact is when there's a lot of this leaf mining that builds up, like you can see in that picture on the right of a marigold, it can actually disrupt photosynthesis of the plant. Um, the little holes poked by the females can allow secondary infection into the plant. And when you get a really large buildup of these leaf mines, it can stunt the plant's growth, it can cause fruit failure, it can even kill a plant, particularly if it's a young plant. At the level of a farm, the impacts can include quarantines, especially as these pests are first starting to establish. Um, it can reduce the yield of crops by stunting plants, but even if the plant is healthy, it can still reduce the marketability of crops um, by putting those leaf mines um, onto the leaves. And the pests tend to be quite costly to manage um, overseas. And this is due a, partly in fact to the fact that they have quite a lot of resistances to different chemicals. And we can look at what sort of impacts have been incurred overseas um, to get a sense of you know, what, the, what the impacts in Australia could be. And for instance, Lyrimyza trifoliae cost growers um, in greenhouses in California 21 million per year when it first established. And when Lyrimyza weedabrensis first established in Indonesia, in potatoes, it was causing up to 70% yield losses. Um, and so we wanna first ask, what is it about these pests that can allow such high losses to occur? And to answer that question, I wanna start with these two pictures of bean crops in Ecuador. One of these bean plants was treated with insecticides and one of them was not, but it's not quite a simple story as it might look because it's the bean plant on the right that's quite heavily impacted by leaf mines that was treated with insecticides. So what's happening here is that these exotic leaf miner, such as vegetable leaf miner, in a natural environment, they're controlled naturally by these little parasitoid wasps. That's their predator. Um, the wasps are, have a pretty cool life cycle. It's like the movie Alien. They'll lay an egg inside the fly larvae. And when that little wasp egg hatches, it eats them from the inside out. Um, but these wasps are really sensitive to chemicals. And when you apply an insecticide, which takes out some of the flies, but also wipes out all of the wasps, you've actually removed the major source of control for that fly from the environment. And without their main predator, they're able to grow to really large numbers and create these big losses. And this is why we consider these exotic leaf miners as really classic secondary pests. They're not really a pest until something changes and they get released from natural control. And this is, what has happened pretty ubiquitously when we look at all those cases overseas where one of these exotic leaf miner arrived and we had these great losses as a result is chemical mismanagements leading to the destruction of the parasitoids. So with that background on what these pests are, I'm gonna tell you a bit about our project which has been running since 2017. We originally started the project just focusing on vegetable leaf miner, Lyrimyza sativi, but we have actually since expanded it to cover the other two that I've mentioned. Um, I work at CSER, we're the project lead. Our other partners include University of Melbourne, Plant Health Australia, and the Northern Australian Quarantine Strategy, and Ausveg, and we'll be running till the end of this year. It's been a very broad project that covers a lot of aspects of preparedness, and because this is just a short talk, I just will give you a bit of a highlight reel as to some of our results. And I wanna start with asking the question of what will risk of vegetable leaf miner look like in our area in Melbourne. So to approach estimating what the risk of vegetable leaf miner will be in our area, we, um, we use essentially a pretty simple approach. We know a lot about the biology of this pest because it's been studied extensively overseas. So we know what temperatures it grows at, what temperatures kills it. We can add to that what we already know about Australian climate through space and through time, and we can get a prediction of where in Australia and what times of the year in Australia can this fly grow and reproduce? And here's the result of that. Anything in the real dark red means the conditions won't let this pest grow at all during the year. So it's too hot, it's too dry, it's too cold, something like that. Um, and the green areas are conditions that are really suitable for the growth of this pest. So if you kind of look at where Melbourne is, you see we're in the yellow zone. So you know the pest is predicted to be able to grow about half of the year. We can sort of look at what time of the year that occurs. Um, and you can see in green is moderate risk periods where we predict the pest can grow and reproduce. So a bit in the spring, a bit in the autumn, but in the winter it's too cold, in the summer it's too hot. 
And if we want some context on that, we can compare it to a much higher risk region, such as Bundaberg, Queensland, where you can see that in Bundaberg, not only can the pest grow more months out of the year, but the growth potential gets a lot higher, which you can see by the dark green compared to the light green in the Melbourne graph. And that together tells us that we're really at medium risk of the pest here, um, which means it's still worthwhile understanding what to be looking out for, should it spread, and having some sense of what management might look like if it ever establishes. So for that reason, um, some real quick pointers about surveillance. For these pests, these leaf miner, you're really looking for the damage, not for the fly itself, because the flies are really tiny and hard to distinguish. Um, so you're looking for that characteristic leaf mining on leaves. It's really important to report things early if you see unusual symptoms, if you see that pattern on crops you've never seen it on before, or if you have a whole bunch, um, it's an unusual level. Um, report it to the exotic pest hotline early and always save a sample of the suspicious damage that you saw because we actually have some really new DNA tests where we can try and tell what sort of fly created that leaf mine. Was it a native? Was it an exotic? Um, we had some handouts we were going to give out, but they're actually linked on the webinar, which is great. Um, and I think we're going to email out the links after as well in case you missed it here. Um, but we do have a lot more information about surveillance available in a guide um, that sort of focuses on Melbourne region. So then what might management for this pest look like um, in Australia should it establish further? Well, we know from overseas that natural control via these parasitoid wasps I mentioned earlier is an absolutely essential part of an IPM program for these exotic leaf miner. And we've actually done some field work up in the Torres Strait and in the Cape York Peninsula, where we do have that population of vegetable leaf miner under quarantine. And we found that already up there, there's at least six different species of parasitoid wasps that are controlling that incursion population. And they're actually doing a really great job of it too, because in some spots we were finding these wasps were killing up to 80% of all the flies in that, in that hot spot. Um, which is a really high level of control and, and also great to see so early in the pest's arrival in Australia. We also did some reviewing of the literature, um, which tells us that Australia has at least 50 different wasp species that could control these leaf miner if they establish. And what's very exciting is this includes species that are already well known overseas for being such important leaf miner managers, um, such as Opius, Diglyphus, and Hemitarsinus, you can see in those pictures below. And we even have our own unique Australian species, like the beautiful striped one on the right, Zagramosoma. Um, and that one's actually doing the majority of control in the Torres Strait right now. So knowing, knowing those options as far as beneficials to control leaf miner, it means when we consider chemical options, a real big priority is to choose chemicals that will minimize disruption to parasitoid populations. So that means avoiding things like OPs and SPs. We also have to consider the life cycle of the vegetable leaf miner means um, chemicals really need to be systemic or translaminar to be able to get to those larvae inside the leaf. And we know from overseas that these all three of these species of leaf miner can develop resistance to insecticides quite readily, um, which also just means we have to be mindful of our choices. And while I don't have any time to go into it here, PHA has been working hard at submitting new minor use permits to cover um, crops that could be affected by leaf miner in Australia. And if you want more information, you're also always welcome to um, send an email through. And again, we have developed a guide, which you'll be able to access in the handouts tab or just via that link, um, which goes over a lot of this um, biological and chemical control and has a bit more information about um, the permits we've been putting through. So that that's, wraps it up. Um, just as a quick summary of what we've covered, um, these three exotic leaf miner species, they affect a number of crops from a variety of families and they have a potential for creating really high levels of damage when they get mismanaged. And we already have one of these species, the vegetable leaf miner, in the Torres Strait and in Cape York Peninsula under quarantine. You're most likely to spot them should they spread by noticing that characteristic spiraling leaf mining damage that they create on a leaf. And if you do see that in unusual crops or unusual numbers, it's always important to report it and take a sample because we do have some native flies that can create similar damage, but it's always best to report it. And in Australia, should this pest ever establish, we know that managing the pest in Australia is gonna be very similar to overseas where we're really gonna have to rely on beneficials to provide natural control in an IPM program. Thank you very much for listening. Great, thanks Celia.
Um, a really great presentation there and a snapshot of some fantastic work over the last uh, couple of years. So thank you. A reminder, if you do want to put some questions to either of our um, presenters to type them into your question bar and come through. Just while we're handing over to the next presenter, um, Ely, you mentioned the, the importance of surveillance and early detection there um, and getting some samples in, obviously, to get the correct ID. Um, the best way to take a sample um, in a top kind of three to five points for people to look out for? Um, it's actually really easy, which is great. If you see a leaf that's got leaf mining in it, all you have to do is pick it, put it in a sealing Ziploc bag, put it in your fridge, call the exotic plant pest hotline. That's it. They'll be able to decide if they want to try and rear things out, if there were larvae present, or they can apply the DNA test that just you know looks for DNA inside the leaf mine. But as long as you put it in a Ziploc bag, sealed it up, put it in a cool place like the fridge, that is a perfect sample. Fantastic. Oh, no, and thank you good for that. To label it, of course, with where you found label, it, label. what and the date. Yes, never forget the label uh, for yes, with any sampling. Well. Excellent. Thanks, Celia. Um, I'd now like to uh, hand over to Callum Fletcher from Ausveg, who's going to take us through the TPP national coordination um, and biosecurity planning project. So, Callum, we can see your slides and are ready um, for you to enter into presenter view. And I'll hand over the microphone and just make sure you're unmuted as well. Brilliant. Can you hear me well? We can, thanks. Perfect. Can you see the slides? We can, yeah. And if you wanted to enter into slideshow view, um, in the PowerPoint. Oh, yes. Sure, there we go. We sh should be able to see those. Yeah, that's great. Over to you. Fantastic. All right. Well, thank you guys for, for having me. I appreciate the, the opportunity to talk and I hopefully won't take too much of uh, go over the, over the time limit. Today, I'm going to talk to you about tomato potato salad, which is a uh, new pest. Um, but I'm going to sort of first give you a background. Um, my, my work uh, is funded through Plant Health Australia and the federal government. I work on pests and diseases that come into the country that affect uh, the vegetable industry. So it's a, a reasonably long funded program. In fact, our program is supported till 2023 now. Uh, and basically we, we, uh, we work on anything that impacts the vegetable industry. So uh, the vegetable leaf miner, uh, the tomato potato psyllid, uh, fall armyworm, a brown marmorated stink bug, a whole range of pests and diseases that uh, have been detected at some point on our border and either uh, have been eradicated or, or, or have, have moved uh, to a, a position where they are not un, or they're unable to be eradicated. So just a quick snapshot of the Australian vegetable industry. It's a significant uh, science industry. Uh, and of course, given the, the broad range of, of um, host crops, uh, the number of, of incursions uh, that we, we have to deal with each year is quite significant. So the system in Australia uh, it allows state and government, uh, state and federal government um, governments to work with industry representative uh, bodies such as Ausbridge, uh, and, and and myself and Zaming to to um, when something new comes into the country uh, and basically a decision is made about the management and eradication efforts uh, that will be conducted. Uh, in order to, to, to attempt um, attempt to, to get rid of it. Now, um, of course, we've had a number of incursions that have moved through to that uh, stage and established themselves, but also have quite a number of, of um, successful eradications. Now, as you can see here, uh, the industry is worth a lot of money uh, and the growing uh, regions in the, in the, in the grey there are, um, are near major ports and airports. So, the vegetable industry is, is, is highly susceptible to new incursions because of, of the amount of trade. That's, to give you a better illustration here, major ports, sorry, major ports uh, are, are, are reasonably close to the major vegetable um, growing regions around Australia. So, uh, as as you can see here, we have had a number of incursions. Okay, so we've had uh, cucumber green model mosaic virus, varroa mite, 
the vegetable leaf miner that, that we've just been speaking about and the tomato potato salad. Now, uh, some, some of these will let go into um, eradication and, and they will be successful, such as um, the Brown Mike Zono. Now that has come in a number of times into the port of Townsville. Each time it has been detected early and been eradicated. Similarly with the Varroa mite um, destructor, uh, which was recently detected uh, in the port of Melbourne, and that was similarly um, uh, eradicated as well. So Australia is one of the only countries in the world in which that does not have um, Varroa uh, destructor. Um, when it came to New Zealand, it made uh, where I worked uh, previously, it made a significant impact on our industries and, and an ongoing cost to to industry for continued management. Other notable pests that we are significantly concerned about uh, that, that uh, are on our radar include bacterial ring rot, Colorado potato beetles, uh, Scaritsis nematode, giant African snail, brown mammary stink probe, and brown mite destructor again, uh, along with um, the vegetable leaf bone, which has come in. Now, brown mammary stink bug is another one. We've had a significant number of incursions over the past couple of years. These have all been successfully eradicated. So when I say on a significant number, here's an illustration of pest intersections at pre-border or at border. Uh, you can see that these are, this is data from the federal government. I'm just, I don't expect you to read it all, but, but uh, down here, I'm not sure how it is, uh, brown mammary stink bug, 385 number of, uh, of interceptions. Now these interceptions uh, could include a broad, uh, quite a large number, or just one single insect. So as you understand, you know, you can understand that our borders are being constantly put under pressure from new pests and diseases coming in through uh, shipping containers, uh, through airports, through luggage, uh, through a whole range of, of, of pathways, including natural pathways uh, like like the vegetable leaf miner, which was uh, potentially blowing in from the north along the Torres Strait. So, as as you can understand, our, our federal agencies are, are under a lot of pressure, but being, being rather successful in intercepting these these uh, pests as they come into the country. Uh, in, in regards to the to the um, Marmorated stink bug, uh, I believe last year we had eight uh, incursions. Now that means they got beyond the border and were establishing themselves uh, in, um, in in the country. Uh, this this was uh, in Queensland, in um, in Sydney, Melbourne, Perth, a um, whole range of areas. And each each time this happens, a large number of efforts need to be made uh, to trap, to limit, to find out where it is, and eradicate. Now these have all been so far been successful. And, and in fact, this year we only had one incursion. So so that's a really um, that's a really good um, positive um, result. Now I'm just going to switch over to tomato potato salad, which was is an example of a pest that has established itself uh, in in Australia, um, a notifiable pest though, because it is only in West Australia. Now um, tomato potato salad is a a, a small uh, small insect, very very small. Uh, you still see my. You still, yeah, uh, two millimetres long, about the size of a, an adult winged aphid. Now, if you look at it under the microscope, it looks like a, a very small cicada. Now, this is a significant pest until prior to its arrival in Australia. We have a list of 42 top high priority pests for the, for the, uh, for the entire uh, plant industries, and it was ranked at number eight. Now, it's a native of Mexico uh, and really only became a significant pest in uh, North America in the 90s as a new aggressive biotype of, type of the, uh, the psyllid emerged and, and started laying, uh, doing significant damage to a, a reasonably large range of crops, solanaceous primarily, which is potato, tomato, capsicum, eggplant, chilies, and uh, also sweet potato, which is not in that, in that class either but uh, a major major pest there but I'll get into get into all of that. Uh, brief history it, it uh, established itself throughout the north of, of America uh, and then in 2005-2006 it was introduced to uh, New Zealand and that was my first time working with it. Uh, basically uh, it was introduced uh, most likely through uh, 
this one uh, smuggling chilies where there was five different uh, incursions of we did a traceback and sadly enough it did establish itself in some glass houses in the south of Auckland uh, now that damage that it did over that, that first year so those four glass houses uh, exceeded one million dollars uh, in, in each one of them it's a significant and, 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 and troubling pest um, basically it, it destroyed their integrated management uh, pest management systems uh, the range of uh, chemicals were needed to control it and even then it was uh, it was still a, a, a significant uh, cause of major yield yield loss further further impacts that that uh, emanated after during that year was closure of market access to a whole range of lucrative international trade um, uh, markets now it spread very very quickly through New Zealand and as and basically over the years has been a con constant and consistent uh, um, to um, the potato industry in particular uh, I will get on to that in a moment so this is it it's uh, very very small as you can see about the size very very small relative to the um, to the uh, five cent piece there uh, here are the nymphs, the young. Okay, there are five stages in stars, uh, and on the one on the right we have the the largest, the fifth in star, the oldest uh, uh, group of of, of nymphs, uh, next to Dorfman uh, and adult um, wing um, psyllid. As you can see, the the, the wing pads are slightly uh, yellowy uh, relative to the body. Other factors other things to look for here we have the the uh, eggs now they are growing around the fringe of of, of the leaf uh the sorry um, laid around the fringe of the leaf and look rather similar to to um lace wing um, lace wings i'm conscious of time so i'll get through these symptoms and, and so on very quickly um now but nymphy, nymph, nymphal feeding uh causes uh release of uh, discharge of, of a sugary substance which uh, as you can see from the images here is quite distinctive now that is one of the key uh, indicators of the presence so if you are looking in your crops and, and trying to see uh, indications of, of psyllid presence this is certainly something that I would recommend you you look for now and it, it, as a consequence uh, it can also um, lead to sooty mold now of course if you're out in the field uh if it's an outdoor field then weather conditions can wash this away but certainly if you are seeing these symptoms uh, it is worth taking a closer look now the psyllid is a vector of a bacteria causing uh candidatus liberobacter psyllidocearum but it's, it causes the bacteria that uh, the, the disease uh, zebra chip. Now, this, as you can see with these symptoms here, is what happens. It, it basically increases the sugar content in, in the tubers, resulting in discolored uh, potatoes, uh, and especially when deep fried. And this is, of course, you can understand a significant issue for the for the potato uh, chipping and and French fry industry. Uh, in, uh, in now we do not have this in Australia the bacteria there has been a significant amount of testing but it is not present but as you can see um, it, it, uh, if it were to be introduced uh, the, the damage that it could do to the potato industries would be significant similarly fresh um, or where potatoes are basically unmarkable when they they have the the symptoms of the bacteria uh, basically it causes a discoloration and uh, poor taste. Now, as I've mentioned, there's a range of host plants, potatoes, tomatoes, capsicums, eggplants, and sweet potatoes. Um, there's also a range of non-crop host plants, such as your nightshades uh, and, and your um, weed uh, um, and, and others. So the, the issue here is that, um, oh, box thorn. Um, the, ex the issue here is that for growers, um, where the psyllid is present, even if the crop is, has been desiccated or, just, or harvested, they will then move back into these wheat um, host um, environments and overwinter and be quite happily um, uh, uh, fed and, and, and happy to reproduce over, over the winter periods. Sadly enough, the, the optimal temperature range is, is quite broad. Um, 
So there are very few areas. I'll go back to them a second. There are very few areas where the psyllid would not be uh, quite happy uh, in Australia. Uh, I was finding uh, live psyllids in sub-zero uh, in snowy conditions in the south island of New Zealand. The optimal temperature is around 27 degrees, which at that temperature, the, the time between an egg uh, growing to uh, sort of around 16 days. So you can imagine how difficult it is as um, Sorry, there's an issue here. Sorry, Callum, we're just losing your audio a little bit there. Okay. So can you uh, can you see me and can you hear me? So we can still hear you. I just dropped your webcam out just to free up a bit of bandwidth there. Okay. Um, so feel free to jump into your slides um, just with the last couple of minutes that we've got. Yes, I understand. Okay. Um, yes, optimal temperature, meaning that uh, the psyllid is quite happy um, across um, um, multiple environments, potential environments in Australia. Now, I'm conscious of time. It arrived uh, two years ago in, in Perth. Um, and I was engaged by the federal government to aid the, uh, the eradication efforts conducted by the West Australians. Um, now, that was a very difficult task as we were needing to, to delimit or, or find out where the psyllid was and was not across the suburbs of Perth. Now, that's a large city and um, has a lot of backyard gardens. So in the end, we were unable to eradicate. One thing that did eventuate out of this sad incursion was that resources were devoted to a transition to management phase, which basically means that if it's were for the first time, uh, uh, resources were directed towards industry to help them best, best manage the, the psyllids straight after the arrival. Or of, of, of that new exotic um, pest. So some of the, um, the results were basically that uh, the cage trials were done uh, where, where uh, beneficials were tested um, and, and found that they do feed on the psyllid and they do recognise it as, as prey and that this can be a, a useful part in a management program combined with um, the use of soft chemicals. Uh, um, the issue with, with the psyllid is because of its significantly short growth period um, that uh, chemical control options uh, run out quite quickly. The use of soft chemicals at the beginning of the season is very is advised and very useful, but because of the concern about the vis development and of, of resistance, uh, you know, chemicals should not be used more than three, three applications. So that has led to uh, the use of more broad spectrum chemical management in the later stages and the most destructive stage of, of the growth period where, where crops are reaching uh, um, harvest stage um, and potentially there is the chance that the psyllid will uh, transmit the bacteria and, and cause uh, significant problems with the quality um, of, of uh, potatoes and, and other um, fruit. But given that it is not that, that is not in Australia at the moment. It, the psyllid is the key target pest that we are worried about. In and of itself, it is a major uh, feeding damage uh, causing insect, uh, releasing a toxin as it feeds, which, which can cause stunting of, of growth uh, and cu cupping of leaves, uh, distortion of fruit and other significant damage to, to all of the, the solanaceous fruiting crops. So certainly something to be concerned about. But um, as it stands, uh, the spread has been reasonably slow. We have new detections in Carnarvon, Geraldton, Albany and Esperance, but it still is confined to um, West Australia and no, no detections have been made in Kananara. So at that, I will, what I'll do is I'll leave up the um, approach, uh, the, the local classes that are currently available, but I would push you to, uh, to the APBMA website to make sure that you're up to speed with um, what chemicals can be potentially used for management. But for that, um, yeah, thank you very much for your time and I'm happy to answer any questions. Fantastic. Thanks for that, Callum. Um, just due to time, we've got a couple of questions that have come through. I might hold those to the end if we do have time um, to get to them. I'm going to hand over now to uh, Callum's colleague, Shakira Johnson from Ausveg. Um, 
and she's going to be talking through the IMAP Pests Sentinel Surveillance for Agriculture. And I'll just make sure we can see and hear Shakira. So I'm just going to unmute you. Thank you. And Shakira, can you hear us okay? Yep, I can hear you. Fantastic. We can see your presentation. So I'll hand over you uh, to you now to take us through that. Thanks very much. Okay. Okay, so yes, I've been invited to speak to you about IMAP Pest today, which is a Sentinel Surveillance for Agriculture. Uh, the program is a new approach to surveillance for plant health. And um, it's a part of the federal government's rural R&D for profit program. So uh, we aim to deliver timely, accurate information about airborne pests and diseases. And it brings together, it, it's kind of a unique um, project in that I'm trying to switch slides and, okay, here we are. So this project brings together all of the plant industry RDCs, which is quite unique. This is the first time it's been done. So we're trying to identify cross capacity and, and needs across the different industries. And we also have a bunch of different people involved in the research. So SADI are really at the core of this smart surveillance initiative. And then we have uh, DPIRD contributing some of their smart surveillance research. Um, Sugar Research, Burkhard over in the UK are contributing to what Sadi are delivering and uh, Rothamsted who are well known for having a series of six metre traps around the UK. And then we have AgVic who are looking at broad scale detection of biosecurity pathogens and pests using next gen sequencing. And then University of Queensland are working with the Cotton RDC and we have a few others involved along the way. So the whole idea about IMAP pests is that it's a sophisticated, coordinated surveillance network. And so that brings together not only the surveillance, uh, where we, we are researching mobile surveillance units, but also then the diagnostics that underpins that surveillance so that we can identify what exactly we're picking up in these airborne mobile surveillance units? And then uh, how do we collect and manage the data? Because there's so much data coming through, we only want to push out to industry the information that is actionable and valuable to industry. And that all comes together with engagement and adoption, which is Ausveg's role in this program. All of this we are aiming to lead to uh, you know, enhanced pest management, um, faster early detection of biosecurity targets and improved area freedom for exports between states and between countries. And so the SADI component involves the development and construction of a suite of these different mobile surveillance units, which we call Sentinels. And so the current Sentinel looks like this. This is the prototype. What you can see here is the six meter trap and a weather station. So on board, we also have two spore samplers. That's this little gray thing here. We've got another one on the other side. And then we have a two meter insect suction trap. Now that's designed to pull in those localized insects that are likely hanging around the crops. And then we've got those uh, insects that are caught in the six meter suction trap, which are likely to pick up those migratory insects. We're also investigating the use of the BioScout system. So you can't see that here, but it's a near real-time monitoring technology that uh, uses imaging and machine learning to identify fungal spores that it collects. You can see that here. Um, our future Sentinels will look a little bit different from this prototype. We're exploring the idea about uh, you know, how can we meet each of the different industries' needs. So while we've got this Sentinel here that has all of the components in one area, maybe we can uh, deliver a more modular unit that speaks to one computer system or one brain to then push out the information. Um, and maybe that will be better for a particular growing region so that we can spread out our efforts. Now we're also working with DeepHerd who have been uh, investigating these uh, real-time uh, imaging 
moth traps. Now these have a lure inside them and a camera and that camera sends an image to up to the cloud and then we can check that out, count how many we're seeing. So Deepad have been focusing on native budworm and diamondback moth, but we're also about to launch into investigating this unit uh, in its use for fall army worm surveillance, which is a very hot topic right now. But once we can get an appropriate lure for this system, then we can help support the federal government's efforts to monitor where fall army worm is and where it isn't. And also Kira, have sorry a to interrupt question. briefly. Um, we're just having yeah. trouble uh, viewing some of the images on your slides. They just seem to be getting clipped by a previous image. Do you mind just quickly exiting out of presenter view and then going back into it, just so we can have a look at that unit? Um, we can see the rest of your slide, it's just being clipped in the top right hand corner. Okay, uh, without yeah, presentation view, yeah, the tricky thing without presentation view is that all those animated images are coming in over the top. No, that's fine. You can feel free to jump back into presenter view. I just wanted to exit and go back in um, just so we don't see. Yep. Go. And we're just seeing the share my webcam request come up. Okay, what we might do is continue on and just see if we can get that to work. Sure. Um, now I'm just seeing myself. That's all right. What I'll do is I'll just drop your webcam okay. out and if you want to jump okay. back into your presentation, that should be fine now. Yeah, great. Yep, great. Okay, so um, we've gone through the spore trapping. Um, we've also got here, just going back. So they have these uh, yellow sticky traps, which most of you should be familiar with. There is an imaging system in here, and once uh, entomologists or anyone monitoring these images that are being sent by the cloud are happy with what they've spotted there, we, um, as some researchers are going out there with a lamp machine, which is a portable PCR machine, and they can do lamp diagnostics on uh, any viruses that are present in the gut of those, or, or present in the aphids. Um, and they're able to, and then um, report on the movement of that virus through that growing region. They're also working on an automated image system for uh, sclerotinia apothecia, which you can see down here. Um, and working through that. Now, a lot of the information that they find during their surveillance efforts are pushed out through the Pest Facts newsletter. Um, and what you can see here, oh no, I'll just move on, okay. So that's the surveillance component of it. But then what you can see here is we have our surveillance targets and analyses. So because it's a cross industry project, we've worked with each of the different RDCs to identify um, targets that are important across as many industries as possible. And then the SADI diagnostics group have identified where they need to develop assays, molecular assays to identify. And uh, these molecular um, assays are designed to support the morphological ID of pests by the entomologists. So while um, traditionally pathogens, just going back, these pathogens down here, there are molecular assays for the identification of those. Uh, traditionally, the identification of insects has relied on morphological identification. And this is quite time consuming and requires a lot of entomologists that are specially trained to identify these. And so we recognise that the high throughput molecular assays will speed up this process. But it's definitely something that a lot of research needs to go into because you're getting these really diverse mixtures of insects in the sample pots that are in the Sentinel collecting those airborne samples. The so DPIRT are also doing a little bit on diagnostics. They're focusing on those uh, lamp assays. Um, they do have uh, their biosecurity team looking at morphological identification of biosecurity fungal plant pathogens. Uh, and they're also looking at the application of lamp to fungal pathogens. And that's in collaboration with the CCDM at Curtin University. 
As I mentioned earlier, AGVIC are working on the broad scale detection of biosecurity targets using NGS. And Sugar doing similar work, but they're focusing on their, uh, their target sugar pests and pathogens. And they're looking at a range of molecular tools to do this um, and looking at ways to speed up and uh, improve their own molecular diagnostics. And the University of Queensland are working with Cotton RDC to also update their molecular toolkit. Now, one of the biggest parts of our project is the data collection and management. So we start off with the Sentinel or the mobile surveillance unit. That could include those uh, moth traps that we were talking about from DPIRD as well. Uh, they might be placed around um, the Sentinel. And then those samples either go to SARDI for morphological ID, or a subset of the samples will go to AGVIC to look at the high throughput diagnostics of those potential biosecurity targets that may be present in the bug soup. Once the SARDI samples have gone through morphological ID, they then go through to the Molecular Diagnostic Centre for molecular ID. And then we also have that deep herd activity going on at the same time. And then all of this information, if we detect a biosecurity target of interest, the sensitive data gets pushed straight to the chief plant health manager that it is relevant to. So if we found something of interest in Queensland, we would notify the Queensland chief plant health manager. And then that information would go directly to Plant Health Australia's Oz Pest Check. All of this information, which is useful for industry and will help industry make decisions about how to manage and control pest and pathogen populations in their growing region, gets pushed through to our team at Data Effects, who then uh, do some field and diagnostics record matching with that weather data that we're getting in. So that includes wind speed, rainfall, humidity, all the factors that are important in a disease triangle uh, you might have the pests present, but you need the other factors as well for disease. So collecting as much rich data as possible. Um, all of that information that we get is sent to Plant Health Australia to support export and area freedom um, activities. But then we also mostly want to focus on pushing out the uh, incidence and prevalence data products to industry. So this is just an example an early example of what we thought it might look like, but this is quite dense. So we're looking at having a faster sort of take home data that growers can get an alert on their phone or their email if they're signed up, if the Sentinel's in their region, but there'll be a range of, of information packages and products that people can interact with depending on what they're interested in. And then the engagement and adoption team at Ausveg will be seeking feedback from industry about what they've seen and how they feel about the data that we're presenting. And that will feed back into our central cloud system data storage, and we'll continually aim to improve this system. And this is just a short two minute video, um, but in the interest of time, just I note that we've gone over a little bit, um, you can check out this video on our website. Uh, so that's www.imatpests.com.au. If you have your phone on you, feel free to take a photo of this QR code. It should direct you to the website immediately. Um, but yeah, I encourage you to visit the website because our information is being pushed out through the website. And we currently have a summary of our heart data up there. Heart is a grains growing region. And we are about to release as of tomorrow, our Nuriutpa data, which is um, in the Barossa Valley. And so then we'll be focusing on data coming out of Cairns because we have recently launched the Sentinel in Queensland. So thank you very much for your time. Great, thanks Shakira, fantastic. And some really exciting um, technology um, and processes to come out of that project, which is excellent and a huge collaboration too. Um, just while we're handing over to our next presenter, um, you mentioned fall armyworm. Um, is it possible to just give a quick overview of what that is um, or where perhaps uh, participants can go for more information? 
Yeah, so we're just exploring our role in Fall Army Worm at the moment. Um, but Ausveg actually have been releasing a lot of information in their weekly updates. So they've been collating all the information that you can uh, you can get or you might need um, on Fall Army Worm. Currently, they've found it in the far north of Queensland. And uh, Biosecurity Queensland have rolled out about 100 traps in addition to the ones that are already out there. And uh, there's a few um, emergency permits that are available, but all of the information is available in the Ausveg weekly updates. So that will be coming out today if anyone's interested in um, engaging with that. It's a really great resource, the weekly update. So yeah, you can find out other stuff too about you know the current coronavirus issue um, within the weekly update. So yeah. All of the information on full hour we there. Great, thanks Shakira, really useful to signpost that. Now we've had a really strong uh, pest management focus with the first three presenters with Ilya Callum and, and Shakira. We're gonna just slightly change um, tack now and uh, hand over to Chanel Day from Nielsen's who's gonna take us through the harvest to home. Chanel, thanks very much for joining us. Um, over to you, what are we uh, going to launch into? Great, thanks for the handover. Um, can everybody see my screen okay? We can, thanks. Fantastic. So I'm going to talk to you about a project that's funded by Hall Innovation, um, most commonly known as Harvest Home, but it's the Vegetable Cluster Consumer Insights Program. And essentially what we're doing as part of that program is tracking um, the consumption behaviour of Australian households with respect to fresh vegetables. We also have a separate project that looks at fruit consumption as well, if that's of interest for you too. Um, but first of all, I just wanted to share some data with you about what we know about the buying patterns of Australian households. So hopefully you can see there on your screen um, three numbers, 31, 62 and 6.3. So what do they mean? So 31, so that's actually the percentage of Australian households who purchased leek over the past year. Um, and I had a look at the buying patterns the year prior, and that's actually pretty consistent with what consumers or the number of consumers that have been buying over the past couple of years. Compared with other vegetables, it's relatively low. Um, most vegetables have um, a higher percentage of households buying than, than leek does. So 62, exactly double the amount of leek. What does that represent? So that's actually the percentage of Australian households that are purchasing celery over the last year. So again, I looked back at the historical data and we can actually see that that's a drop in compared with the percentage of households buying just a year prior. The year prior, about 66% of Australian households actually purchased celery. So you might be wondering why the drop? Well, I had a look at um, the volume and the value data for both leek and celery. And what we saw is that the volume sold through retail on both of those products was actually down a little bit, but the higher, the, but prices actually increased but prices increase significantly more for celery than what they did for leek. Um, and it's quite common when we see higher prices at retail that some buyers actually do drop out of the, the category. Potentially one factor that might be driving that, there has been a, a celery juicing craze um, over the past couple of years following the release of a book um, by a, a medical um, mandate guy called Anthony William. So that might be driving um, some of those higher prices that we saw, uh, at least at retail on celery. So 6.3, so that actually represents the percentage of dollar sales growth that we saw at retail across all fresh vegetables over the last year. So we've seen from a volume perspective, a fairly consistent trend, that is that a little bit less volume is moving through supermarkets at the moment, but on average, the retail prices are higher and that's actually driven overall dollar sales growth uh, for fresh vegetables over the past year. So a lot of the insights that we provide and some of the insights that I'll share with you through the presentation today are actually housed on a dashboard or a website called Harvest to Home. Hopefully many of you are familiar with that already. I'm going to click through to the site um, just briefly to show you what it looks like, but if you have a pen handy or a camera, I'd encourage you to write down the name of the site or otherwise take a photo of the screen and then you can go back and explore the website in your own time. There's a huge amount of information available on the website that 29 vegetables are included, 15 fruits and also two nut products. And it's updated on a monthly basis with the latest data. But let's just jump in and take a quick look at the type of information you can have, you can find. Can you see that or is that not working? 
So Chanel, we're just uh, looking at your presentation still. We might just need to, on the sharing drop down box on your control panel, just share yep. all screen instead of just PowerPoint and we'll be able to see your browser. Okay, let's see if I can figure that out. Share all screen. So sharing just at the top there and this should be an option to show a window or a whole screen. Um, okay, got it. Uh, screen. Let's have a look. Let me know if you can actually see the website when that pops up. If not, I can close out of the, the demo and you can jump in and have a look on your own Yeah, time. that's great. The browser's just come up now and we can see the website. Okay, fantastic, great. Let me just lose the photo of myself. Okay. Great, so when you jump onto the landing page, um, you can see it's really easy to navigate. You can either select on the vegetable tab, and if you click that, it will take you through to the vegetable information, or you can select fruit, mushrooms, and nuts, which is actually another project that we have with Hall Innovation. Now, there's a schedule here which lets you know when the dashboard is going to be updated. So you can click through here and see, okay, what vegetables are being updated on what date. So if you're looking for this in the latest data, you can see when it is that you need to come back. But we'll just click through to the vegetable screen and you can see there, I'm just gonna close out my taskbar too. Okay. Um, so there are all the vegetables that you can access information on uh, in the dashboard. Now, if, if digging around a screen is, is not the how you like to read information, you'd rather read a hard copy print. Beside each vegetable, you see that there's actually a little print button. If you click on that button, it'll download a PDF for you, and then you can actually print the information out and read it in hard copy if that's what you prefer. Otherwise, you can just click on the different vegetables to navigate through the website, or click on any of the bars at the top here um, to take you through specific um, pieces of information. So for example, there's a market overview page, which gives you key metrics by state, as long as a number of other charts. Um, there's a retailer tab, which gives you information about um, the share and growth of the different retailer channels, and so on and so forth. One tab that's a really handy one to visit on a regular basis is this case study tab. Here at the Nielsen team are doing analysis every month about particular topics or particular products, where we actually um, analyze the data for you and provide it in a digestible article format. So for example, if you're interested in pumpkins, there's an article that we've just written, which analyzes the data and wraps it all up into the kind of the key points that you need to know. But I'll go back to the presentation now. Please let me know if you can see back on that original presentation screen, Harvest to Home. Yes, so we'll come through at this end. Thanks, Janelle. Perfect, excellent. But I'll talk you through some of the key insights that we've learned um, through the project over the past few years. So one thing that we know is that supermarkets have gradually been gaining share in fresh vegetables. So this line up here gives you the um, dollar sales share of the major supermarkets. So our definition of major supermarkets is Coles, Plus, Woolworths and Aldi combined. Um, everybody knows that they dominate the market, but this puts a number on it for you and shows how it's changing over time. So back in 2018, we can see that those uh, major retailers had about 74% of trade in, in all fresh vegetables. That's increased a little bit, so it's now representing about 75% of trade. The light blue line underneath, um, where you can see 16% on the left-hand side for 2018, that actually represents the green grocer and market um, segment of the market. So, you know, your independent fruit stores would be, fruit and vegetable stores would be the major um, type of store that you'll find in, in that sector. But you'll see that their share has just been gradually declining over time. So we see back in 2018, their share was sitting about 16%, dropped then to about 15% in 2019, and now sitting at about 14%. So we see that pretty consistently across fruit as well, just that green grocer segment, um, starting to struggle and just gradually losing share over time. Now, the other group of uh, stores that we have there is other supermarkets. Now, in that group, we would include things like IGA, Richie's, um, Costco. Um, back in 2018, they had about 10% share and that's climbed now to about 11%. So those supermarkets also gaining a little bit of share from those green grocers and markets. The main driver of growth actually in that other supermarket se sector has actually been Costco. So Costco have been rolling out stores, um, as you would know, um, over the past couple of years. They don't have a large number of stores, but the stores that they do have um, do have a significant amount of trade. So we are seeing um, them actually take you know, quite a little bit of share there. 
So what does that mean for specific categories? Well, I wanted to highlight um, the case of broccoli and the tongue twister broccolini baby broccoli, um, because it just shows you how not all products trade in those channels in different ways. So the light green bar, my mouse isn't working, so I can't highlight it for you, unfortunately. But on the left there, you see that 69.5% of all broccoli sales actually go through those major supermarkets. Now that's less than the share that they have um, in um, fresh vegetables overall. So they have about 75% of share of fresh vegetables. So broccoli is what we would call under trading in those major retailers. In contrast, broccolini baby broccoli have about 84% of all of those sales are going through the major supermarkets. So we can see quite clearly from the data here that those major supermarkets are focused more on selling the broccolini baby broccoli products more so than they are uh, on broccoli because the shares don't represent their share um, compared when we compare it with total the total fruit market, total vegetable market. Um, the green grocer share, obviously, of here we go, of bro baby broccolini broccoli. Broccolini, baby broccoli is, is quite small, 9% compared with a 14% share of all vegetables, but they're over trading in um, broccoli. So what does that really mean for you guys? Um, well, well, I think it means that if you're in, in baby broccoli or broccolini as a product, there's actually more opportunity to grow your sales in that green grocer um, and market segment because that product is not as equally well represented in that channel. And if you're a broccoli producer, you know, certainly talking with your retail partners, the major retailers about getting more ranging, um, better profile in the stores, et cetera, to grow their share is also an opportunity to grow broccoli sales as well. Another piece of research that we did was looking at um, the occasions when consumers are actually eating the vegetables that they buy. So every month we collect data about what actual purchases they're making and then ask a series of questions about how they use the vegetables and what they think about them, whether they're satisfied with their purchases or not. And you can see there that people in Australia are mostly consuming the vegetables that they purchase for dinner. And they eat a fairly broad repertoire of vegetables at dinner time as well. So vegetables that are largely cooked, um, focused there. So people are obviously spending more time at dinner. When it comes to the lunch occasion, which is the occasion that is most second in terms of vegetable consumption, there's a much more limited repertoire of vegetables that consumers are eating. So the ones that stood out in terms of having a significant amount of the households eating them at, at that time of day uh, were lettuce, cucumber and fresh salad. So all of those salad types of vegetables, it's a much more narrow repertoire um, being consumed during the lunch occasion. Interestingly, people, more households are snacking on vegetables than eating them for breakfast. So breakfast is really the consumption occasion or the time of day where Australian households are just not really eating any kind of vegetables. Interestingly, spinach and kale um, jump out there, which is a bit of a surprise to me. Just to clarify, we didn't include mushrooms and tomatoes as part of this research, so they were not included in that breakfast consumption occasion. Spinach and kale were, and um, one of the items that was coming up the rankings fairly quickly, but still only had a fairly small number of households um, consuming that breakfast was celery. So I think that that ties back into that celery juice craze that we spoke about earlier. So I think just looking at the nature of the products that are focused, we can tell that the green smoothies for breakfast, because this is actually weekday consumption as well, is something that some consumers at least are actually starting to add vegetables into their diet through that type of occasion. So if we look specifically at um, the percentage of households eating across breakfast, with lunch and dinner during the week, we see that the average across all vegetables, that only 2% of the households that purchased a particular type of vegetable were eating it at breakfast. So practically nobody is eating um, vegetables for breakfast. A few more are eating them for lunch. So about one in three households, just under 30% of the households that are buying vegetables are eating them for lunch. And there we see dinner, 76% of all households, um, you know, really eating their vegetables in the dinner occasion. When it comes to spinach, which is the dark green line, this is where we see that big jump in the number of households that are buying, eating it for breakfast. So definitely a lot of green smoothies there or being added on to eggs um, for weekday breakfasts. Um, more consumption of spinach at the lunch occasion, which is great, um, and a little bit less at dinner time with um, more competition across those broader range of vegetables being eaten at that time of day. So we know that Australians aren't eating their five serves of vegetables each day, and this chart is a really easy way to see why that's not the case. Households are eating for dinner, but they're really not eating vegetables for lunch, and they're certainly not eating them for breakfast. So anything that we can do with our products or our retail partners to try and increase consumption occasions at those times of day 
is a great way and a huge opportunity to further grow vegetable consumption. So we see ready to eat salads as another opportunity that hasn't yet run its, its course. We can see here from the data, and this is um, from the middle of last year, so the numbers will have shifted a little bit, but the trend's likely the same. Um, consumers have moved a little bit away from loose leaf salad, more into bagged and ready to eat salad options. We do think with um, a greater focus on prepared salad options that are readily available for consumers at lunch, that that is a big opportunity that has not yet been um, realised by Australian retailers and growers as well. With the coronavirus, um, I think that there's likely to be even further shifts away from loose leaf salad into bagged and prepared options. I expect that we'll see that across the, the um, produce department as consumers are wanting to increasingly protect themselves against any surfaces or any um, products that might actually carry the virus. So we also looked at what are the, some of the key barriers um, to consumers purchasing vegetables at all. And what came out as a really interesting learning is that not wanting to waste any was actually a significant barrier. In fact, the most important barrier to not actually to, to consumers actually not buying or not buying more of their vegetables. There was a significant barrier for 27 of the 28 vegetables included in the research. So you would have heard a lot in the news over the last couple of years about consumers' concerns about waste, whether that's economic or whether it's driven by environmental concerns. But we are definitely seeing um, come through in the consumer research data that this is a real barrier for people to buy more vegetables and actually a dampener of demand, surprisingly. You might think that consumers throwing product at home actually creates more demand for vegetables. But what we're seeing in the data is that it actually creates an unnecessary dampener of demand for people actually buying vegetables. So people not liking it is the second um, biggest reason. And interestingly, coming in at number three was consumers thinking that they consume enough to balance their diet. Whereas as I mentioned before, we know that consumers don't eat enough vegetables. They don't make their five serves of vegetables each day and they don't really eat vegetables at the lunch or the breakfast occasion. So we need to change that thinking as well. In practical terms, we're seeing these types of um, shifts in consumer demand translate into the types of pack sizes that people are buying. So over the past 12 months, we've seen consumers shift away from medium sized um, fresh pack salad bags into smaller serves and larger serves as well. So we believe that that drive into smaller serves of less than 100 grams is actually driven by consumers' concerns about waste. So they're moving to packs where they're actually gonna consume the whole pack in one serving, one sitting or in a couple of sittings. We're also seeing some consumers at least shift to those larger packs. Now we believe that this is because of increased occasions. We've been collecting the data for a couple of years now and we do know that particularly around that lunch occasion, people are starting to eat um, salad products more frequently at that lunch occasion. So it would be great to be able to build on that momentum um, and actually grow more salads of vegetables um, through that occasion as well. So strategies to consider teach consumers how to use more of the vegetables they buy. And we know that that breakfast occasion is really a key opportunity and that some consumers at least are using their vegetables in green smoothies at that time of day. We can add beetroot to smoothies. We can add a whole range of different products, ginger, um, leafy salad vegetables, a whole range of things, carrots even. So how can we encourage consumers to um, adopt that type of consumption behaviour to reduce waste and increase more vegetables at that time of day? Reducing portion sizes is also um, a key strategy to tap into this change. So the issue of not liking them or consuming enough. So this is really about needing to change consumers' perceptions. Um, I know when I grew up that we used, were told to eat vegetables because they were healthy, but it probably isn't the most motivating reason. We need to help consumers change their perception so that they want to eat a greater repertoire or greater variety of vegetables across more of those consumption occasions during the day. If we're able to achieve that and get people eating more vegetables more frequently because they want to, then there's a big opportunity to grow vegetable consumption yet. So I want to, before I finish, talk about two key um, trends. The first one is in channel. So you, you probably already are aware that online grocery sales um, are growing quite quickly in Australia, but this slide here puts a number on it for you. So online grocery sales grew at more than 30% over the past year. So more than seven times the rate of the total grocery market. Consumers um, have not been quick to um, buy fresh products online, but they are becoming much more comfortable with purchasing fresh products, including vegetables online. So I think that we are at a tipping point where more consumers will shop in this channel. So 
So being able to understand how to develop your products and market them in this type of channel is really key to capturing this opportunity. It's even more relevant now because we think online is really set for rapid uptake, particularly as a result of the coronavirus. And we're all doing this on webinar today rather than meeting face to face because of this fundamental shift in behaviour. We've been tracking the data and we have seen that the panic purchasing that you're seeing in grocery stores has actually extended online. We think that over the coming months, consumers will make it a habit to continue purchasing online and the, the growth that we expect to see online over the next year will even be greater than seven, the seven times we saw over the past year. So again, if you're not able to work in this channel or your products aren't adapted to transport in this channel, it's going to be a missed opportunity for you. And the final thing to finish off is just to talk about um, the changing face of the Australian consumer. So 30 years ago, we know that most of the immigration coming to Australia was really coming from countries in Europe. However, the past decade that's changed dramatically and most immigration into Australia is now coming from Asian countries. These customers want different things and they shop a little bit differently. So it's important to understand that and ensure that your business is adapting to meet those changes. So the exciting thing for the vegetable industry is that um, customers out of Asia actually spend significantly more of their grocery basket, basket on fresh products. So they buy more fresh foods but they also shop in slightly different places as well. They allocate a greater share of their fresh basket to green grocers, markets, and also Asian grocers as well, which are growing quite quickly too, um, rather than the major supermarkets. So they're more likely to buy things like herbs, leafy vegetables, um, and then obviously types of fruits like lychees, et cetera. But understanding that that shift is real and it is changing and it will continue is really important to making sure that your business can adapt um, and take advantage of that trend as well. But that's the end of the presentation for me. So I look forward to perhaps answering some questions at the end of the session. Fantastic, thanks Chanel, that's really interesting. And I think the old adage of, uh, if you can't monitor, you can't manage, um, is very true with those those numbers, some really great insights um, there. Just while we're handing over to our next presenter. Um, Chanel, you mentioned uh, some changes there with, coronavirus um, in terms of what might be an opportunity, so increase in bag um, sales and pot uh, potentially shift or increase importance in online. Are you seeing um, or predicting any other major trends to, to happen due to COVID-19? They would be the key ones, but what I'll share with you after the call is we've actually put together a Nielsen Global website, which is actually collecting all of the data from countries around the world and all of the latest developments on coronavirus. Um, it's publicly available, so I'll share that with you and you can share it with the panellists too so they can jump on and have a look. But hopefully we don't see consumers shy away from buying fresh fruits. I think it's it's a possibility. We haven't seen it come through in the data yet, um, but let's hope that that doesn't happen. No, thank you. Well, look, thanks Chanel um, for joining us. Um, I'd now like to hand over to Syed Rizvi from Charles Sturt University, um, who's going to take us back onto the, the pest management focus around um, supporting beneficial arthropods. Um, so I'll just unmute uh, your microphone and I'll stop sharing Chanel's webcam. If you could just jump into your presenter view and I'll hand over to you. Thanks very much. Is that is that okay? Can you hear me? We can hear you and see your slides. Fine, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, before starting my presentation, I actually want to give you a brief overview of the say like uh, factors which really triggered this project into being. Um, so. Uh, as we all know that the uh, Australian, not only Australian, but the global uh, vegetable industry is facing a lot of challenges. Uh, so some of them like uh, agriculture intensification and prophylactic or heavy insecticide spray. Well, each of them have its own consequences, but um, uh, essentially they are disturbing uh, ecological balance of agriculture system and they are producing insecticide resistance among some key pests actually 
uh, we all know some kind of uh, remedy like by using organic farming system, conservation or biological control or, in, or uh, IPM st strategies. But uh, here I'm going to talk about uh, mainly focus on habitat management. Um, if uh, you know about habitat management, uh, well, if you don't know about habitat management, then habitat management is basically uh, is an advanced approach of conservational biological control. And it works, uh, basically it suppresses pest densities, usually by improving natural enemy efficiency. How basically through altering vegetation pattern. There is There are two main way to uh, alter the vegetation. One is to either you diversify your landscape by using or by insert by you uh, by riparian regions or by using shelter belts there is another way you can uh, uh, provide you can use flowering plants uh, uh, flowering plants banker plants um, or trap plants which basically provide resources subsidies to natural enemies example that's um, one of the very successful projects in china by using marigold next to the uh, rice crop that's a picture i've taken from western australia that's a sorghum which is known to harbor meaning uh, uh, harbor lace wings which is an which is a beneficial insect next to the capsicum field <clears throat> in my in my project, we work, we work on both strategies. So in the first phase, we worked on, uh, we basically collected, uh, so we sampled around 500 vegetable fields um, across Australia. And we consider all sort of uh, farms, like uh, whether they are using IPM um, uh, pest management strategies or conventional, they are organic, whatever farm they are, we consider all sort of farms. and. Uh, to determine the effect of adjacent land use or vegetation types of uh, types on arthropod community of the vegetable crop. Actually, what we have done, see, this is the shaded area. This is our actual focal crop. And uh, we have taken the, uh, we have sampled 10 plants from the age of each focal, uh, from the focal crop of age of focal crop, which were adjacent to the uh, where uh, different land use type. We have also taken a uh, sample from the center just to compare the results. <clears throat> Our result shows that the natural enemies and pest abundance are significantly influenced by the adjacent land use type. So uh, non-crop vegetation such as uh, especially shelter belts, riparian regions, they are really enhance the uh, abundance of beneficials and they uh, reduce the abundance of uh, population of uh, pest. Uh, so that's the shelter, the effect of shelter belt on the abundance of beneficial. These are actually uh, different adjacent land use type we, we encounter during our field survey. So that's a shelter belt effect on beneficial is quite high, uh, while this is the uh, pest abundance in, uh, on, on the focal crop, which were adjacent to the shelter belts. Uh, we found another very really exciting result that the crop which were planted next to each other, for example, brassica next to brassica or sweet corn next to sweet corn, they have a very they have a disadvantage in terms of uh, uh, in terms of beneficial insect abundance um, and they and this so, sort of uh, uh, sort of vegetation style favors pest abundance. So. Uh, so basically, uh, we found that the shelter, especially shelter belts, riparian region, they are very good uh, adjacent land use type uh, in terms of beneficial. But how we can get this in absence of shelter? Because you know, like if we advise a farmer to grow shelter belt, it take ages. Or so, uh, what could be the quick remedy? So if we uh, we can get the similar results of shelter belt. So. <clears throat> We try to uh, we try to develop some 
uh, some habitat management strategies using uh, uh, using different habitat management uh, uh, we're using different strategies for example first what we have done it actually uh, we have the field survey data we have done an extensive literature review to know the uh, best habitat uh, best or and successful habitat management strategies around the world uh, and we also uh, we also found found out that the what sources are available in australia and then we have conducted more than 70 farmer in, uh, interviews of more than 70 farmers uh, to know their attitude towards uh, habitat management strategies and uh, whether um, whether our uh, suggested habitat management strategies strategies are going to work in their farming style and in last we have we have a stakeholder advisory committee to which uh, to whom we discuss the associated risk of the potential habitat management strategies uh, like um, whether they will attract some pest or something like that. so we come up uh, basically two two habitat management strategies one by using flowering plants the other one by using trap plants um, i'm not going to uh, discuss uh, trap plants here because the the trial is still under uh, is underway and uh, we are still getting data but the flowering plants trial are almost finished and we have a good uh, presentable result which i'm going to present here so when we talk about the flowering plants uh, habitat management using flowering plant species we come up with three plants uh, three flowering plants which is sweet elysium buckwheat and cornflower but these selections this selection of plants is actually not a random we consider uh, many criteria and some of which are uh, the plant should not be exotic to australia so these three plants are basically available in australia they are well adopted to the australian climate they are not considered as a weed in australia and the fourth and the very important criteria these plants are not identified for favoring pest we i'm talking about brassica here so these three plants actually are not being identified as a uh, to favor the pest of brassica pest actually so uh, these three plants uh, flowering plants we uh, we we have conducted more than 15 field trials across australia in different states of course in different which and different in a climate um, different climatic range and you know this time it was a, a very this time was a very dry air hot air but it's still our flowering plants these three flowering plants were amazing in growth um this the the left bottom picture is basically uh from the south australia farm walk the farmers were really engaging in this one we had a very good media coverage and uh, um so uh these three uh, the, the the flowering trials and these um these are my little warriors actually uh you are usually in encountered where during our field survey uh there are other as well but th these are the most abundant the beneficial insects like parasitic bars we have a three two to three different types of parasitic bars we uh we collected uh, during our field survey or, or and on our sticky traps as well so this is the uh results uh from the field survey uh well we have more than 15 uh fields but i'm going to present the data from three fields here so the you can understand the pattern which is almost similar in all fields so this one shows the uh population of the beneficial the three uh, figures the last three figures the down the three figures show the uh, abundance of pest x-axis show the uh, uh, the distance from the treatment so uh, the uh, distance from the flowering strips actually so that's a five uh, zero meter mean which is ne the, uh, next to the flowering strips and then five ten fifteen and then twenty the blue line shows the population of um, beneficials in the flowering plot 
and while the red one shows the beneficial uh, population in the control plot control plot is basically uh, the, uh, basically the vegetable field where, with a barren land having no flowering strip actually it clearly shows that the uh, beneficial significantly enhanced by the flowering strips it have they are very significant when you compare with the control fields the pattern is similar in all three fields while in pest actually uh, the control usually have a low a high number of pests than the flowering plots actually actually there is we found the trend the and the, and the trend is basically uh, pest is uh, tend to be suppressed by the flowering strips uh so if i conclude my con uh, my my presentation so our flowering uh, sorry our field survey shows that the non crop vegetation which is a um, uh, mainly shelter bend and riparian regions uh, are basically associated with the high number of beneficial and low number of pests and uh, um, and our field trials uh, conduct uh, which we conducted using three flowering uh, plant species shows a very strong association with the high number of uh, beneficial insects and most of the beneficial insect we found is uh, lady beetle lace wings uh, red and blue beetle carbide beetle damsel bug and parasitoid wasps i think that is all thank you very much excellent thanks sayed and thanks for uh going through your presentation uh, nice and quickly, but some, some fantastic information there and some great research. I like the reference to the little warriors uh, <laughs> with the lady beetles and others and lace wings. Um, now we're just about to go 5.30. I'm conscious of people's time and also affording each of our presenters um, the opportunity to go through their great content. Danielle, is it okay if we um, try and condense your presentation down to five or six minutes um, and we'll try and just go 10 minutes over time. If people do need to go at 5.30, please feel free um, to jump off. We'll make the recording available, but I want to make sure we get a chance to go through the EnviroBridge material as our second last presenter. So Danielle, over to you and thanks very much. Thank you, Carl. So, yeah, my name is Danielle Park and I work with Ozvedge on the Envirovedge program. This is uh, an environmental best management practice uh, program funded as part of the Vegetable R&D Levy project. Um, Envirovedge has developed best practice resources linked to uh, current research and development. The program's been operating for a number of years um, and it's had a particularly strong history uh, within uh, Victoria, so it's been very well supported. Um, through Victoria over the years. The current EnviroVeg project draws together three previously separate industry environmental management programs, which is OzVeg, is EnviroVeg, Fresh Care Environmental and Hort 360. And it's these three components that are drawing together to, to develop a new program. Through 2019, we were trialling this new approach with vegetable growers from across key growing regions. And so what I'm gonna be doing today is highlighting a few of the changes and getting people started so they've got an idea of how they might start the new EnviroVeg program. So if you didn't notice, this is the new logo. So uh, it's important to note that this uh, EnviroVeg program that we're on at the moment has this new logo. So hopefully we'll be looking forward to seeing that as a method of, of showing and, and recognising the great work that vegetable producers in Australia do um, as, a, as a part of this project. The other great resource that's been developed through the EnviroVeg program is a new website and some technical resources. So hopefully everybody gets offline after this session and goes and has a look. There's plenty of information on here and I would encourage everybody to have a look um, and register your interest and then I can get in contact with you and give you a little bit more detail than I'll be able to cover today. So the first step, and this is the, the point where everyone begins, is an online self-assessment. So this has actually changed quite a bit from the previous uh, iterations of EnviroVeg. So there's a, there's a training component, which is step two, and an audit component where we work with Fresh Care Environmental. I won't be covering a lot of detail on either step two or three. I will just cover step one in detail today. So step one. 
So as it says, it's an online tool. So this is a new uh, approach that we're taking. So we're working with Growcom and using their Port 360 platform to actually ask a number of questions about practices occurring in vegetable production to identify where things are going well and where there might be opportunity for things to improve. Once a business or a property completes that, uh, that self-assessment, what they end up with is an individual property report which highlights the risks that they, their business might have. It also highlights the strengths and it highlights where they might want to have some future action. One of the key strengths or one of the key benefits we've got these days with having an online tool is it does allow that tracking of, um, of performance over time. That means ben benchmarking your own business over time or in, in terms of uh, comparing to industry. It also links through to some great resources that we have. So just to give you a bit of an idea, here are the 10 sections that are included as a part of the EnviroReg self-assessment. So land and soil, biosecurity, which we've touched on a number of elements of that today, chemicals, uh, biodiversity as well as something we've touched on a little bit. Um, so there's a number of elements in here that allows us to give a, bit, a really broad understanding of where a business is up to whether in, with regards to environmental sustainability. So just to give you an idea, this is what a question looks like. So when you go through to complete uh, an EnviroVeg self-assessment, you get asked, you get posed a question. Do you have appropriate biosecurity signage? I thought this one might be topical given today's um, some of today's presenters. So a, a person then identifies for that property what particular practice best aligns with what they do. In this particular case, they've selected that the signs are located at key entry points and office. Um, this sort of detail then allows us to, to respond and identify how things are going. Once completed, a report is generated. So what you can see here is that I, there's 23% complete for land and soil and 88% complete for biosecurity. Those will need to be 100 before a report is generated. But the most important thing is that if you get busy, which is what happens, uh, all of the results and all of the input that you've included is saved and you can come back to it at a time when you've got a little bit more uh, office time. So as I said, once completed, an individual property report is generated. This is the summary for the business management section of those 10. Each of the questions that you answer gets a score depending on what particular practice you've identified and you get an overall percentage. Following this summary is a very detailed report identifying those, each of those practices and linking you through to some technical resources. If you do get a one or a two, they're the areas where you might want to have a bit of a look at whether there are improvements that can be made and that report links you through to those resources. So it's a way of signposting and getting you to where you need to go. For each of these sections, you then get a calculated percentage and that's important when it comes to the benchmarking. So as I said, benchmarking is something that is new to EnviroVeg. And what you can see here is that the red dot is a particular example uh, vegetable producer's result. I will just note that this is a fictional property. We, we do not share private information without, uh, other than with the particular producer or grower. So, but what you can see is that the red dot shows where a particular vegetable producer sits with relevance to the rest of the industry. And, you can, and that gives a bit of an idea of performance in terms of relative to other, other growers. So land and soil, biosecurity, chemicals, fertilizer and soil additives, water, biodiversity, waste, air, energy, and that business management section we looked at before. The other item you can do with the benchmarking is actually track the performance over time. So this is two uh, self-assessments that have been completed with a gap of time and you can see that there's some changes that have been occurring. So this allows people to track and prioritise where they might want to work. From my perspective, I put the uh, biosecurity uh, result there and think that's higher is better and uh, that would be something I'd be wanting to have a conversation with that particular grower about what they might want to do to resolve that, that lower response. So as I've said, the step one is the self-assessment online for EnviroVeg, the online tool, individual property report and benchmarking and linking through to those resources. 
So some of the benefits we've found from producers today is that that access to up-to-date resources and linking through is really valuable. So it's a number of producers or growers who've tested this product for us in 2009 have highlighted that as a benefit. The ability to identify risks in that biosecurity in the energy and in the waste section have also been raised as particular benefits uh, for people who've tested this new system. And there are opportunities to reduce wastage when it comes to nutrition, chemicals and water. So just to touch on it, once that self-assessment's completed, we do offer training via webinar, uh, which is particularly appropriate today. So hopefully uh, yeah, we've got a few people able to use the system just to show that you can do it. We don't have to be in the same room. Um, what we do is we review the self-assessment results and develop a plan of action with the grower. We link with technical resources and support. I'm very lucky in that I work with a really strong team of biosecurity specialists and that allows me to respond to a number of those um, technical areas directly. Um, but I do have a network. We have a network of um, resources and support that we can draw upon when, uh, when particular challenges or risks exist. Um, once the, the training is completed, a grower can then go through, if they wish to, to get a fresh care environmental audit. If they're successful in that, they're actually then able to use the EnviroVeg logo. So the objectives of EnviroVeg is to gather data on the uptake of best practices. So this is about telling the story about the responsibility and the environmental sustainable practices of Australian vegetable producers, both as individuals and also at an industry level. It's about supporting and improving environmental management on farm, identifying where there might be some some really great wins and some stories to tell, uh, and also identifying areas we might want to put a little bit more focus on. But it's about beginning to facilitate that program recognition. So hopefully in the future, we'll be seeing more of those logos on vegetables in Australia. Hopefully that's five minutes. If you've got any more info, anything else you want to have a look at, the EnviroEdge website, as I've said, or give me a call or get in contact with me directly. And uh, is that five minutes or did I go even faster? Uh, you've done very well. Thanks, Danielle. That's fantastic. And um, thanks for being flexible too, as we uh, run up against the clock. And look, I am conscious of uh, minimising overrun, but making sure we uh, stick to the ambitious program that we set ourselves with seven presenters in 90 minutes. So look, what I'm going to do now, very briefly, is just take you through our last uh, topic, which is soil wealth and integrated crop protection. I'll give you the three minute uh, elevator pitch, um, but please do feel free to uh, follow up with any of the presenters today or myself. Um, so look, what I wanted to cover very briefly, um, RMCG and AHR are the deliverers of, of the National um, Extension Project, Soil Wealth and Integrated Crop Protection. What I really wanted to cover today, um, three take homes. Um, learn, experience and connect is, is our extension strategy, which I'll uh, spend uh, 30 seconds to a minute on each of those points. Um, and, but secondly, innovation doesn't need to be expensive or complex, which we're finding as we're working with growers through our demonstration sites, for example, and healthy soils at the end of the day will give you healthy plants. Um, so to jump into that first key message uh, around learn, you know, the problem we were finding was how do you know if information on improved soil management and plant health is the real deal? Um, and the solutions we have through the Soil Wealth ICP project, um, we've got you covered through things like training and events, um, resources, and also some global scan and reviews that look abroad and bring that R&D and package it up for growers in the Australian context. Some examples here of uh, where we've done that with strip tillage with a number of uh, different formats and growers, as well as uh, looking at managing uh, cover crops as well in various commercial production systems. So experience, our second take home or a point of the extension strategy, the problem we found um, and the need within industry was, will a new piece of equipment or a change in management suit my production system in my area? And the solution to that is you're really seeing innovations firsthand in a practical setting. Um, and we've established a national network of demonstration sites in each of the major uh, vegetable growing regions around Australia that either showcase some new equipment like strip tillage, spot uh, spray systems or roller crimpers, 
um, but also looking at um, cutting edge technologies. So some of the more precision ag focused applications around EM38 mapping and remote insect monitoring stations. And what does that look like in the field? Here's some uh, sample shots from our KUIRUP demonstration site, um, which was just gonna be near Clyde where we were presenting this evening, um, but we can look at that virtually. Uh, so some traps, variable rate spreading, um, but the chance to talk through those on farm face to face with uh, industry participants and importantly other growers. Um, over in the West, our compost trial there supported with some um, data collection, but also a really nice uh, case study to present the findings back to industry. And just lastly, connect. Um, the third problem we were finding was, you know, how can I keep up to date with the latest developments? Surely there's others out there that can help me. Um, and we have done a bit of a multi-pronged approach at uh, communication around an overarching website, a monthly e-newsletter, some social media, um, but also broader industry um, media coverage, as well as a partnership network that are connecting advisors, suppliers and others um, involved in the industry with each other to share uh, experiences and um, really learn. So uh, this is a quick snapshot of our website, which is soilwealth.com.au. If you haven't checked it out and would like some further information, please head there. Um, and a sample of our communication um, outputs there as well around newsletters and magazine articles. Um, so very briefly, just to finish up, how to get involved. Um, we do have a monthly e-newsletter, which you can sign up to. Uh, stay in touch either online or at one of the training and events um, that we involve uh, and run around the country. The demo sites, there's one near you. Um, and if you are a supplier or um, provider, please think about the uh, partnership network as well. Um, there's many other conferences and bits and pieces we get to, um, Hawk Connections too. Um, in June of this year as well. So look, that is the uh, conclusion of today's webinar. My apologies for the overrun, but I did want to make sure we got to each of the presenters. It was always ambitious with the last minute change, but look, I think it does show that we can be uh, nimble and relatively responsive to industry needs, even if there are evolving um, situations around the coronavirus. I think there's many other ways to connect. So look, a big thank you to our presenters, Elia, Callum, Shakira, Chanel, Saeed and Danielle. Um, thank you too to my colleagues, Clinton Muller, CJ Wilkins and, and Hugh Wardle for designing today and putting a lot of effort in behind the scenes to get us here. My name's Kyle Larson from RMCG and we hopefully will see you at our next webinar. Thanks everyone and take care.